Great, thank you. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today and the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and any Aboriginal people here today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Gilhooley. For those that don't know me, I'm the Assistant Auditor General for the Financial Audit Group at Vago. You know, in my career, I found that um, audit offices are really not well understood the world over, in fact. It's usually thought of somewhere between a bad trip to the dentist and the Spanish Inquisition. But believe it or not, we all want the same thing that you do, and that's to improve the lives of Victorians. Sure, the independent financial assurance we provide boards and others is fairly well understood and a valued service, especially for this group. But our mandate, our independence, and our deep reach gives us a unique position about what is going on across all elements of the public sector, both vertically and horizontally. We hope that you would see us as one of the unique, trusted, truly independent sources of assurance and advice that you can get anywhere. Perhaps today's event will help shape that thinking about it. So today is not about getting together to talk about technical issues or standards. We hope you get that information from other sources. But the title today says something about what we're going to talk about. Although we're hosting this, we hope that you'll see this as your forum for the chairs. What we've been trying to create here today is a thought leadership space for you to talk about strategic issues that you may be facing and also to share what we know, leveraging the investments we've already made on your behalf. We also hope this is a unique opportunity for you to engage and network with your audit committee chair colleagues from across government. You'll notice that um, we have quite a few of our financial audit sector directors here today. We also have some performance audit directors here. You can identify them from their different name tags than the rest of you have. And we also have a number of our audit service provider partners who help us carry out our financial audit mandate. They would all be delighted to meet with you and talk about things of mutual interest. Some Vago staff will be available after lunch up until about 2 o'clock for smaller sector-specific group discussions if you wish. We hope to continue these forums, perhaps alternating between the regions and the CBD perhaps a few times a year. And we'll ask your views about that in a brief post-event survey. We're also recording the event today and we'll make that available after the event as well as the slide decks that we have for you. So we really want this to be an interactive event. In addition to roving mics, we're also using a web-based polling service. Feel free to try it out at the address um, that will come up on the screen and uh, post and vote on questions you would like to see addressed today. Questions not answered will be captured and sent out with answers with the slide deck a few days after the event. So here on the, the next slide is what we're going to be covering today, covering this morning. First of all, Andrew is going to talk about some key strate strategic issues he sees for the broader public sector, his views about how the public's trust has been eroded, and some key takeaways for what you individually and collectively could do to restore confidence in the public service. Next, Dave is going to take us through some very interesting material on data analytics, data science, and data protection as it relates to our ongoing journey and learnings. I think there are some important takeaways for any government organization in that session. We'll then take a refreshment break and network morning tea. And finally, Ben will bring us home to talk about how we figure out what to deliver, how we deliver it, and how we judge whether we're successful. He will also talk about what we see are some strategic issues going forward and risks, and our plans to cover those areas through our performance audit work program. You'll, you'll notice over on the back there that we're showcasing some aspects of the technology-led audit of the future and um, a number of staff are on hand during the day that can answer your questions, both at tea, um, during and after lunch. And I think there's also some things you can try, hands-on things you can try out as well. We're allowing some time for Q&A between each session. And as I mentioned, you can also use the, the polling app anytime to ask questions and see what's on everyone's mind. So I encourage you to vote early and vote often. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, washrooms are through the, the big doors and, and through the, on the left-hand side past the staircase there. And um, out of mutual respect for everyone here today, please keep your phones off or on silent during the session times. Thank you very much. It would be appreciated. So on to the program. So I'm going to introduce Andrew for his session. So many of you know Andrew. He has over 30 years experience in public sector external and internal audits at the federal, state, and local government levels. He was the Auditor General of Queensland from 2011 to 2016. 
And from 2003 to 2011, Andrew held the roles, various roles at Vago, including Assistant Auditor General for both performance and financial audit. Please join me in welcoming Andrew. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, I'm very gratified to see um, all of you here today. Uh, the conception of this forum, in fact, has its genesis in Queensland when I was the Queensland Auditor General, and it was put to me, and I, I was probably thinking the same thing anyway, that um, audit committees and audit committee chairs and audit officers have very convergent objectives. We are both about oversighting the internal control frameworks in organisations and making sure those organisations deliver their services efficiently, effectively and economically. So given our kind of convergent objectives, it just made sense to me that we should really try to reach out to this community of practice and help strengthen the community of practice. So as Bill said, the conception is it's a forum uh, a, a basically a, 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 a venue for us to exchange ideas, to challenge each other, to question each other, and hopefully through that, and through particularly the networking that we're um, providing the different breaks, you'll get to talk to your peers and share your experience and your knowledge, and so together we'll kind of uplift um, the internal audit, the external audit, and the audit committee uh, kind of communities of practice. So I'm really pleased that um, I've been able to inaugurate this here in Victoria. And uh, I was just saying to Lorinda on my table that um, when we started this in Queensland, we had about 30 chairs show up and I think they get about 60 or 70. So we've got over 100 people here today. So it must mean at least that for this one, you're interested in what we've got to say. Uh, what I've said to Bill, he's got a performance measure on this. This was the first performance measure. Will anyone show up? But the real performance measure, as those of you who are in um, private practice know, is do you get repeat business? So his real performance measure is going to be when we run the next forum and whether anybody shows up for that. So we'll try and make sure that we keep you um, slightly entertained and amused, but hopefully informed uh, through our presentations. And so there's kind of three presentations, three vignettes, I'd, I'd suggest they are, very short, sharp overviews. And the idea is to stimulate debate. We're not here to tell you the answers. I don't think we have all the answers. I think you, you probably have more answers than we have, given your roles with your organisation. So I wanted the conversation to be very strategic uh, and a basis for catalysing debate and catalysing discussion, rather than, as Bill said, try and tell you about the latest technical accounting standard and how to implement that. And so while Bill said we're not going to talk about accounting standards, and we're not, but if you've really got a pressing need and want to talk about accounting standards, you'll be able to register that desire through the Poll Ev app or through the questions you ask off the floor, and then we'll see if we can respond to that, maybe not immediately at this forum today, but in a follow-up forum or in other ways that we may communicate with you through our audit processes. So I normally start um, my talks um, kind of setting some context and I would think that most of you would have seen this slide or be familiar with this slide in its various formats and it's about the three lines of defence and where you're situated within the three lines of defence within an organisation. Uh, you know, the internal audit function uh, and the oversight by the audit committee of that function. Um, is this third line of defence, third line because ostensibly it's independent of line management. And I'm all about trying to make sure that that third line of defence is strong and effective. Why do I want that? Well, it stops me having to do work. If internal audit's doing its job, if the audit committee's doing its job, if the organisation has a strong internal control framework, that my auditors can rely on, uh, the dividend for that for your organisation is not just that you can be assured yourselves that you're doing your job well, but that my financial auditors and my audit service providers will necessarily need to do less work. So I've got a vested interest in making sure you're effective and that third line of defence is effective. 
How does it situate with external audit? Some of you may have seen this slide when I give a talk on integrity and the integrity framework within Victoria. And it's tried to juxtapose the audit office against the other two uh, independent integrity functions that exist in most Western jurisdictions around the world. Of course, auditors general claim primacy because we've been around since day one. I know that, for example, at the Commonwealth level, the fourth act passed was the Audit Act in 1901, when Australia was made a federation. And of course, the Audit Act was passed here in Victoria well before that, and we've been around for over 160 years. These ombudsmen, they're kind of, you know, new, new, new things. You know, they've only been around 30 or 40 years, maybe 50 now, coming up. And of course, the, the advent of corruption, anti-corruption commissions, IBACs, ICACs and the like have been a more recent phenomenon, but they must be reflecting something. The growth in this integrity, as some people unkindly call it, industry, must be a reaction to something that's going on in the public sector and in the political space. And we need to really reflect on why this has happened and why now there's a call for a Commonwealth IBAC. Where do we sit in this integrity landscape as an audit office? Where do I think we sit? Well, we talk about the spectrum from efficient, effective, compliant operations through to malfeasance and malpractice and maladministration in between. And I always argue that IBACs in particular, and to some extent ombudsmen, are in that reactive space of investigating potential corruption, looking at maladministration. Um, where I situate my office and how I distinguish between my office and their office is we're in a proactive space rather than a reactive space. So we spend all of our time down trying to make sure that your organisations are efficient and effective and compliant with laws and regulations. It doesn't mean we don't traverse up into the corruption space or the malpractice, maladministration space, uh, but that's not our major consideration. Our auditing standards, in fact, say we must have regard to things like fraud and corruption and non-compliance with laws and regulations. And of course, right at the moment, I'm considering non-compliance with the Public Administration Act as it goes to government advertising. That's something I have to have regard to in my financial audit. But it's not the primary purpose of a financial audit. And in fact, it's not the primary purpose of a performance audit. And so the last point I make on this slide, and I think this is the most important point to make on this slide, is that people think that integrity means a lack of corruption. And I would argue that integrity means much more than just the absence of corruption. I think integrity also encompasses the fact that your organisation is efficient and effective. My proposition is that you're not acting, public servants aren't acting with integrity if they are not being efficient and effective. So I bring those two dimensions at least, and if not the compliance dimension, into this idea of integrity, what integrity actually means for the public service and more importantly what integrity means for the public, the residents of Victoria and the ratepayers and the taxpayers of Victoria. This must be their conception of integrity. So I'm going to talk about some strategic risks and challenges and I was with Jane Brockington's committee um, a few months ago down at Vicpol and um, I was asked a question, uh, you know, Andrew, what keeps you awake at night? Now, I know it wasn't a personal question. It was really just about, you know, the public sector. And so I had pause for thought there uh, and I gave an immediate response and even dwelling on that, uh, since that immediate response, uh, I think I've still got the same concerns as I uh, kind of espoused at that audit committee meeting. My starting point for my concern is the thematics we used to do. When I got here, my predecessor would run, a, would produce a thematic report at the end of every year saying this is what we you know, have derived or inferred or implied from the audits we've done over the last 12 months. And that was the last thematic report we did in terms of the areas where we thought there was a need for an uplift. And so I'm going to reflect on what's shifted between then and now. And I'm going to start with something that kind of underpins 
these thematics. And I'll start with 2016 because I came here under, you know, circumstances that weren't uh, planned or expected. Uh, but I got here after the East West Link report was tabled. And I got here after, very shortly after, a whole range of reviews had been done, particularly at the Commonwealth level, um, the lessons learned from failure kind of reports that were done, you know, the housing insulation scheme, and a quarterly essay that was written by Laura Tingle. And there was a lot of commentary around the time about um, trust. And one of the points that they spoke to in relation to trust is whether or not the public service was positioned and was providing full and frank advice. So this was an editorial that The Age ran shortly after I got here in 2016. And basically the, the editorial said there was a prevailing, the prevailing ethos is one of diffidence when they should be frank and fearless, and they being the public service. Departments are narrowly interpreting the legislation on which they operate and their codes of conduct, and the public service has become too timid to lay its opinions on the line, in part because individuals fear that contradicting the government's policies will blunt their potential influence or sour their careers. So that's an editorial. We can agree with it or not. I wanted to see what commentators have been saying about that since 2016. So Gary Banks gave the Alf Radigan lecture in 2018 and Gary came back to this theme. And you can read what he says there. And he's just, an, it's an exhortation, if you like, that um, reminds us that we're there to give apolitical advice, full and frank advice. But his observation in that report, uh, and I'd commend it to you, it's worth a read, um, was that this concept of full and frank advice has become, uh, in some parts at least, of the public service. And I'm not just talking here about Victoria, I'm sure Gary was talking more broadly about this public service at the Australian government level and in other state jurisdictions. That this idea of full and frank advice has become a bit of an anachronism. And in fact, um, it's kind of a matter of um, derision and a little bit of a matter of laughter as to whether or not this is really ever uh, possible under the current environment. When I came here, I was very heartened to hear people like Chris Eccles stand up and talk about reprofessionalising the public service and, and recommitting and rededicating uh, himself and the public service to providing this full and frank advice to, uh, to the executive of the day. And I had a meeting just recently with the departmental secretary and we spoke about this because you know, when I do performance audits, what I want to understand is how was the executive advised? People ask me, you know, you know you're not allowed to question the merits of policy objectives, Andrew, and quite rightly I'm not. But gee, I want to understand how full and complete the advice was that went to the executive, either in them forming their decisions or after they took their decisions, how were they advised about those decisions, particularly if the decisions were made in the absence of advice. And of course we know in the political cycle a lot of government decisions are made in the absence of advice, some of them in the absence of advice totally, you know, and we can refer, to, I'll refer to Australian government examples, you know, back of the envelope or something, examples of a decision to let's, you know, redo Snowy Hydro. Um, sometimes they're made in the absence of advice from the public service. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No one, I think everyone accepts contestability and advice these days. Um, but there is a question, well, if they're not listening to the public service or if the public service isn't providing advice, what's going wrong there? So is there still an issue today with this? I'm not sure. Um, is it vestigial? Is it a leftover? Um, have we re-established a professional public service? And this is as much at state government as the local government level. I guess I've got a couple of reports, one being tabled right now, so hopefully I'm not breaching the Audit Act. Uh, has it been tabled? Well, okay. Just right, don't leave this room. You're not allowed to leave the room until that report's tabled. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we still find some of this when we, when we look at it. So we don't always look at this in all the audits that we do, but we still do find um, 
a lack of full advice. So it's not necessarily that it's not frank, but maybe it's just not full. And is this because the executive is not demanding it or because we're not prepared to provide it? So again, I don't have an answer. What I'm trying to do is stimulate your debate uh, between yourselves. And, I, and what I'm always going to pose with these slides is, what role is there for an audit committee in this space? You know, do your internal audit programs ever look at policy formulation and advising? Do your internal audit programs ever ask about how information flows up to the executive? And do they ever look at whether or not the executive and how the executive treats with the public sector? Do your internal audit programs ever go to these core APS values and ask how they're being exhibited, at least in this space of policy formulation and advice? But one of the uh, hypotheses about maybe the fact that public servants aren't being listened to, uh, and Bill Scales said as much when he pointed to, I think, I don't know if he called it a serious malaise, but a malaise nevertheless in the public sector was one of the problems could be that we're not as skillful as we were in this space. So one of the reasons they might not be listening to us is because we're not providing them good quality advice. And I think this is the more important issue for us that we face today in the public sector. What I talk about as the hollowing out of the public sector. And I'm not here to advocate for or against outsourcing. I'm not, it's not, that's not the point. The point is simply to say that where we are situated today through outsourcing, uh, through various cycles of downsizing the public sector and resizing the public sector, through various cycles of focusing on uh, you know, front-end service delivery and maybe not focusing as much on the basic bread and butter housekeeping and the core services that exist to support service delivery. For whatever reason, uh, myself and other commentators are concerned about this loss of skill and knowledge in the public sector. So, you know, Bernie Fraser responded to um, Laura Tingle's um, quarterly essay that was put out around about 2016, Political Amnesia, How We Forgot to Govern. Again, I think still relevant today, worth reading. It's behind a paywall, so you've got to pay some money for it, but it's still worth the investment, I think. It's a few tens of dollars. And Gary came back, and so he had a, he's had a shot. Again, I, we're not having a shot necessarily at the consultants per se, it's about how we're structuring and delivering government services. Is this really a challenge? So again, uh, and I'll come back to this when I get to the thematics. Um, in terms of an audit committee, in terms of the internal audit programs, in terms of your contemplation of the internal control structures within your organisation, one of the things that external auditors certainly have regard to is what we call the control environment. So many of you may be familiar with that COSO framework, the five elements of internal control. And one of them we talk about is the control environment. Embedded within the control environment is the concept that you've got a capable workforce. And I wonder whether or not and to what extent internal audit actually looks at capability of workforce in the delivery of whatever it functions that are being provided whether they're back office corporate functions, whether they're frontline service delivery functions. The reason I'm really vested in this and, and interested in this is because I really want to get to the root cause of problems. And I think a lot of root cause comes to either lack of capacity, not insufficient resources, or lack of capability. Do not have the applied knowledge and skills to actually deliver what they're being asked to deliver. And so what is our response? Well, the response has been a flight of knowledge and skill. The increasing growth in the use of consultants and contractors to deliver. And this is the Centre for Policy Development submission. Um, Terry Moran, the chair, um, made a submission to the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit and Administration in, um, at the federal level after the Auditor General there kind of blew the whistle on how much growth there had been in um, expenditure on consultants. And um, these are worrying signs and I wonder to what extent they may exist uh, within your own organisations. 
that we're in fact now almost using consultants as contractors rather than permanently uh, employing people to do the job they've been asked to do. Uh, the budget's not helping us, of course, at the Victorian level with this call now for a further efficiency dividend. And the, I think the, the basic advice was you guys work it out. You work out where you're going to cut. My plea is that we, we have regard to those back office functions as being really important, um, as as much regard we have to the front line service delivery functions. So there, I think there's a risk here. Um, I see it evident uh, most recently, so I will come back to accounting standards. I've seen it most re evident recently. We've had a huge raft of brand new accounting standards, um, which we're all grappling with. And we're looking at the quality of the advice that audit committees and organisations are getting. And of course, the organisations have to turn to the private sector for this advice. They're not equipped, they don't attract and retain the people within their own business to keep pace with and understand uh, accounting standards. Um, and yet we're starting to see, it's a trend, a kind of a diminution in the quality of advice that's coming through. And uh, people have speculated. Someone's told me, well, you know what, everyone's being sucked off because of the um, Royal Commission into the banks and everyone's being sucked into the banking area to support them and uplift them and therefore we're losing the talent pool that might have been available to organisations had that not happened. So this is, these are scarce resources. You know, we haven't got them in the public sector and now we can't even find them in the private sector. So it's a real challenge for us if we're going to get our heads around how we're going to cope with these new accounting standards. More worryingly, I heard um, it reported to me by um, no, I won't say who it was, in what context. Uh, some, some, I've heard some opinions about the quality of the work that's being done by the private sector when it's commissioned for the public sector. And the concern was that the people who are doing it, they weren't brought up in and steeped in the public sector. They themselves don't really understand public sector service delivery. And so you're kind of setting them up to fail and you're getting yourself a sense of false assurance in terms of the advice, you know, I think the days of us buying a name are well beyond us. You know, I want a name to put on a piece of paper to demonstrate I'm doing a great thing. Um, and now I think we're actually, and that may have been, you know, you may have been getting great advice. What I'm worried now is that that, that quality of the advice is itself slipping and that's a challenge, not just for the public sector, but obviously for those private sector firms who are providing the advice. You know, here's an example where we talked about the loss of skill and, and, and it's, 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 it's a really apposite example, isn't it? Because it's the skill in managing the outsourcing. So we've decided to outsource and manage contracts and we haven't even got skilled people who can manage the outsourcing. You know, I can remember when I was in uh, the federal government in the audit office there, we were amazed they actually engaged consultants to manage the contractors. So just think about that for a while. Okay, so where are we? If we take those kind of scene setting, where are we now? I still think we've got a fair bit to do. So I'm gonna walk quickly now because I've probably used up most of my time. And no, no, is it all right, Richard? That's, I thought he was coming down here to tell me to shut up, but that's okay. Um, I don't think we've solved everything. I've greyed out a couple of areas, There's pro but probably because we haven't looked in that space. So I'm not gonna say that, you know, we've got nothing to worry about in terms of financial sustainability, for example. But if I look at the reports we've done over the last couple of years, still I think we've got work to do in these areas. And if we're going to be rebuilding trust, uh, I would suggest to you or I'd commend to you that in your internal audit programs and in your oversight of your organisations, have regard to these areas. And I'll take you through and give you some examples from recent reports which speak to some of the problems we find in these areas. The governance and oversight um, gee, it's been a perennial. When I was here last time, we spoke about oversight deficits. We've had ducat reviews in the health space. We've had a whole range of reviews that speak to um, the centre not oversighting um, the outliers. That manifests itself in lots and lots of different contexts. We talk about oversight of the central agencies or by the central agencies. We talk about oversight, say, of someone like health and human services over the hospital system. Um, have we got the oversight right? 
have we got it clear who's responsible for what and are we effectively monitoring and oversighting what's going on? So we talked about access to mental health services report where we, we talked about this, monitoring was a part of it. We're not monitoring what's going on in the system. How does the centre understand performance? Does that performance ends up impacting back on the centre, on the funding that's provided, and it actually impacts on the lives of Victorians, the ultimate outcomes. And, and I would say this is as much for councils as it is for health bodies, as it is for uh, state government departments. And the state purchase contracts, again, um, no real picture of what the government was spending. I, I just found that really a little bit disturbing but quite fascinating that in, in 2018 that no one had a view of what the state public sector was spending. Uh, and a part of that, and I'll come to it, is, is the fragmentation and the siloing of information. Something I hope is being addressed. You know, we've got the centralised banking system now, we're looking to move to Oracle in the cloud. I would hope we're starting to rethink about the idea of having a central ledger, you know, which was a feature when I started in the public service in about 1980, uh, where all the transactions were captured centrally. Um, so we'll see where we go with that. So, Again, in framing your audit programs and in looking at performance, ask yourself, is there an oversight deficit here? Is there a monitoring deficit? Is this something we should be concerned about? Role confusion, this leadership dimension to me is important. Again, I see this manifest itself in a number of different settings. I always talk about this kind of trifecta that I'm looking for in an organisation. I'm looking for an alignment of roles and responsibilities that goes with those roles with legitimate authority to discharge the role. So I talk about role responsibility aligned with authority. It's no good telling someone they've got this job if they haven't got the legitimate authority to discharge the job and then aligning the accountability against those roles and responsibilities. So to me that's a nice trifecta. That's what we're always trying to seek um, and hopefully it manifests itself in like single point accountability. What I'm concerned about is we can't even get the roles and responsibilities sorted. So let's not even worry about accountability or authority because people aren't actually sure what their job is. And we've seen it, it manifested in many reports where there's this pointing the fingers. I particularly see it between the state government and the local government. You know, the different expectations, the different understandings of what should be pretty clear um, as expressed in things like legislation is a lack of communication. So again, root cause. Are we not performing because people really aren't clear what their role is? And then, even if they are clear what their role is, have they got the authority to discharge it? Do they have the sufficient positional authority in the organisation? Tabled a report yesterday on child and youth mental health and we spoke particularly about the positional authority of the chief psychiatrist, or in fact the lack of positional authority of the chief psychiatrist who plays such a fundamentally important role in child and youth mental health and mental health more broadly. So positional authority, um, do they have the resource authority? You know, we, you know we, we all do the ANZOG stuff and we talk about the authorising environment. This is really important to the authorising environment. I just had to throw this in this morning because this is from the report we tabled yesterday. Talk about role confusion. I don't expect you to understand it because we don't understand it either. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a bit of a sad indictment on that system in relation to child and youth mental health about who the different players are, who the actors are, where the authority is held, where the accountability flows to and from. So uh, again, I, if you want to um, be quite disturbed but also informed, read that report we tabled yesterday. And I've mentioned information silos, and Dave, that's a segue for Dave Barry, because Dave's going to come and talk to you about data analytics and our, our role to try and break down these information and data silos. Um, so um, that's an area we need to focus on. Investing in capability, I've already mentioned this when I was talking about skills deficits. This is an extract when we had a look at um, crime data. So it's about investing or reinvesting in the skills of the public sector workforce. 
And the last area, I still think we've got a long way to go and I heard some great overtures when I came back here about a move to outcomes reporting. I've yet to see it, so I'm not sure where that's gone. I hope it hasn't been buried. Um, but I think we really need to get much more serious about reporting on outcomes, understanding and tracking outcomes and stop the debate about attribution and just focus on the outcomes. Uh, within that, of course, um, can we rely on the public reporting? We'll all have our own views about BP3, Budget Paper 3, output measures for the state government and we've obviously got the service performance indicators for local government. Um, are they the right ones? We've questioned whether or not they are. Certainly we're questioning the lack of outcome measures um, in the delivery of public services. So again, does your internal audit look at public reporting? Either in the annual reports of operations where the states are supposed to talk about their BP3 outcomes? And does it look at it from the point of view, is, this, is it fairly representing performance? Is it focusing on the right things? And how is it being used, more importantly, back in the organisation for the organisation to reflect on itself? And is that information being used in decision making to try and uplift and improve service performance? So I think there's still plenty of areas. I'm sure there are many, many more areas. These are the ones that occurred to me following that prompt at the Vic Poll Audit Committee about what keeps me awake at night.